Our next segment, we're going to Jerusalem to speak with Rabbi Arik Asherman, one of the founders of Rabbis for Human Rights, who this weekend experienced an attack by an Israeli extremist who tried to knife him. He'll talk about this. The video has gone viral. But right now, we're staying with Charles Glass. Charles Glass is the former ABC News chief Middle East correspondent. His latest book is called Syria Burning, ISIS and the Death of the Arab Spring. He's just returned from Syria and Iraq. Why do you call it Syria Burning? Well, we had to come up with a title that would sell, really. I, it was—but it's appropriate, because Syria, since late 2011, has been on fire. And we, we see the evidence of this and the fact that more than half of the population is now homeless, seven million people internally displaced, and five million people have fled the country altogether. And it's uh, because this country is being rapidly destroyed in a, in a conflict that probably should never have happened. Why did it happen? It happened for a number of reasons. One, in 2011, there was a great wave of protests sweeping the Arab world, Tunisia, uh, Egypt, Libya, and, uh, and then Syria. And the Syrians were part of that wave. But they're there in Syria because the opposition took up arms, which never happened in Egypt or Tunisia. Uh, they seem to have gone more for the Libyan model, where they did take up arms. It, it led to chaos, because the, the opposition itself was, was very fractured. You have to remember that in Syria, political opposition was always suppressed, particularly democratic opposition. And they, they were not unified. And so within the first 18 months, according to IHS Jains, there were already more than 1,000 armed groups in Syria, sometimes fighting one another, which was very good for the regime, sometimes fighting the regime. But the, 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 the anarchy was, was destroying the country. Now there are fewer groups, because they've coalesced into various Islamic fronts. But still, the, the destruction is, is unprecedented, and, and Syria will probably never recover from it. And talk about the factions and how Bashar al-Assad hangs on to power. Well, Bashar al-Assad hangs on to power, first of all, because he inherited a very effective security state from his father. Remember, between 1949, when the CIA overthrew Syria's elected government in order to put a an oil pipeline from Saudi Arabia through Syria without Syrian preconditions. From 1949 until 1970, when his father, when Hafez al-Assad took power, there had been a coup d'etat in Syria almost every year, and the, the, the instability was, was crippling the country. His father, who was a great conspirator, had been minister of defense, and was from the Alawite sect, which is a sub-branch of Shia Islam, which is very secretive, because they don't really want the Sunnis to know all of their beliefs. They were very conspiratorial anyway. So they were the most conspiratorial people in the, in the regime, and they were able to take over the regime and solidify the regime. And there, were, there hasn't been a military coup since. So they were, they were very strong, well prepared to overthrow, to, to, to face that kind of thing. And then they had a Muslim Brotherhood uprising between 1979 and 1982, which they suppressed. So they, they were effectively very strong, in addition to which they had enriched a lot of the Sunni Muslim Arab middle class in, in the big cities of Aleppo and Damascus. So they had support. Now, it's, it, if the Sunnis, if some Sunnis did not support them, they wouldn't be there. They, they then, when they faced this armed opposition, they had a strong army that did not crack, as the United States predicted. Uh, its, its officers didn't defect to the Free Syrian Army. And so the country, the, the, inst the state institutions, unlike Iraq, held together. And they're still holding together. I mean, the, the rebels hold perhaps 65 percent of the territory, but the regime has between 60 and 80 percent of the population. And what about the outside forces and the role, for example, that the U.S. has played, the role that Iran has played, the role that Russia has played? Well, the, they've, Russia and the U.S. have played equivalent roles on, on opposite sides. So Russia consistently arming, supporting the regime at the U.N., and the U.S. doing the same for the opposition, um, without actually meeting to discuss ways so that, the, that this is not going to be resolved by, by war. The regime was never going to lose a war, can't win a war, because both sides are equally strong, which means the war goes on and on. But they, the, the, problem is, the problem for the Syrians is that, that they're facing a proxy war, as well as their own local war, as well as a regional war between Saudi Arabia and Iran, between Sunnis and Shia, because the Saudis now perceive Bashar al-Assad as an Alawite usurper. They want to see a Sunni 
running the country, because 65 percent of the population is Sunni, and they, they will settle for nothing less. But actually, it's really up to the Syrians. It should be up to the Syrians to decide who's, who's going to lead them. And, and inevitably, because Assad has been so strong, he'll have to be part of the transition, not because you like him or dislike him, but because he's held on. I wanted to turn to the Democratic uh, presidential debate. Um, <clears throat> and this is uh, uh, Governor Martin O'Malley um, criticizing Hillary Clinton's call for a no-fly zone in Syria. Does she, we heard our, does yes. she want to use military force too rapidly? I believe that, as uh, president, I would um, not be so quick to pull for a military tool I believe that a no-fly zone in Syria at this time, actually, Secretary, would be a mistake. You have to enforce no-fly zones. And I believe, especially with the Russian Air Force in the air, it could lead to an escalation because of an accident that we would deeply regret. Let me say, because there's a lot of, of loose talk going on here, we are already flying in Syria, just as we are flying in Iraq. Right. The president has made a very tough decision. What I believe and why I have advocated that the no-fly zone, which of course would be in a coalition, be put on the table is because I'm trying to figure out what leverage we have to get Russia to the table. Let me just respond to something the secretary said. Uh, first of all, she is talking about, as I understand, that a no-fly zone in Syria, which I think is a very dangerous uh, situation, could lead to real problems. That was Bernie Sanders at the end, and, of course, before that, Hillary Clinton and Martin O'Malley. Charles Glass, your response? Well, Turkey has been pushing for no-fly zone and safe havens in northern Syria from the, from the very beginning. Um, the U.S., the Pentagon, originally opposed it because it would mean taking out, in the first instance, all of Syria's air defenses, which were put in by the Russians, so not an easy task. And some of those air defenses are probably now manned by Russians, which would mean, in order for U.S. planes to fly safely over the country, possibly killing Russians in those, no, in those air defense zones. Second, the idea of these safe havens means that people would be fleeing there for safety, just as they did in Bosnia. And we remember what happened in Srebrenica. There is no such thing as a safe haven. And you'd have to commit tens of thousands of troops to protect those areas from either side that might want to come in and massacre them. And I, it, it would then be troops on the ground from Russia and the United States in a very, very confused and dangerous situation. You just did a piece for the New York Review of Books, and in it you write, major military decisions come from the Iranian general Qasem Soleimani, the astute commander of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard's elite Quds Force, rather than from Syria's discredited officer class. Explain. Well, because the Syrian army lost so much territory in the early phases of the war, I mean, it lost control of Homs, the third, third major city in the country. Uh, they had to turn to the Iranians, and the Iranians weren't simply going to throw men and weapons at Syria without some control over them. So that has, give, that has given Iran a decisive say in Syrian military strategy. Without, without, I mean, I should say that without Iran and Russia backing the regime, the regime probably would have fallen. But the, they're, they're now there, and they are trying to con take control. They're now the Russians are taking more control from the Iranians, because they are becoming more decisive as the, the leading ally of the Syrian regime. And what do you think will happen, and what do you make of this meeting right now in Vienna? Well, I would like to hope that they'll meet in Vienna and come up with a formula that they can impose on the Syrian parties to end the war. I have my, but based on, on the failure of Geneva I and Geneva II, my fear is that they will simply stick to their old positions and not come to an agreement, not impose a settlement, and then go on arming both sides destroying the lives and, and uh, homes of the Syrian people.